Did you know, Jungle, that you gave me one of the most helpful pieces of poker advice I've ever received? What's that? I did not know that. Do you remember the house party we were at like 10, 12, 14 years ago? We should talk a bit about your, uh, your products that you've, uh, you've got. Because you've got one that's um, a bit about chip leading, is, is my understanding, and about porn and play and how to do all that stuff. You've got the chip leader AI that I personally was curious of how that worked. That seemed like a really advanced and novel thing. I've never heard of this in the poker market uh, as well. I mean, you've also like um, got uh, the soft skill optimization route and uh, I've got a lot of things going on, it looks like. Do you want to talk about what some of your products and what do you what are your thoughts on the, are making them? Yeah, um, I'll start with our two flagship products. Uh, the first of which being uh, chip leader AI. It's a subscription platform, I guess you could say. And I remember I was at this Chinese New Year party years ago with a guy, you know, introducing, oh, I play poker, poker coaching site, yada, yada, yada. He's like, oh, I have a childhood education, like AI platform with learning. And I'm like, uh, and he's like, and you can teach it to teach anything. And so the way that Chip Leader AI is designed is as a student gets in there and like starts playing and doing the different hands and like each hand kind of looks like a poker tracker, right? You like, it folds, do you pre-flop? Do you open or fold? Uh, or sometimes it's much more elaborate, like on the river after all these decisions, like what's the optimal decision? Sometimes it even says like against a tight player, against a loose player under ICM constraints. But as the engine gets to know you as a player, if you're struggling at something, it'll keep feeding you those like rudimentary, like kind of simple decisions until you have a better understanding before it shoots you into the branches and like opens all the learning paths. Because like, like you said, you have to understand preflop before you can really dive deeper into the hand. And so the, the AI machine that I actually designed the brain. So like I designed, you have to learn this before this, before this, before this, but it's like much more intricate and literally does kind of look like a tree as it grows. So it's like, you have to start here. And then as you open these different paths to these branches, you can learn all of the different concepts. And then in that thing, we also have every single path or node in the pick your path section. So if someone just specifically wants to go and look at facing three bets or three betting or squeezing or four betting or even just preflop raising or triple barreling, you know, so there's over 180 or 200 different nodes that you can go and practice like individually if you know exactly what you want to work on. Plus we have uh, weekly online sessions and webinars that we upload. So like the online sessions are kind of like a private Twitch stream. I'll play online, camera, screen record, and I'll talk through all my decisions to really give the students an idea of what I'm thinking about while I'm playing. And then the webinars are, you know, you can win a one-on-one -on -one or two-on-one -on -one rather with me and Foxen. And we'll answer all the students' questions about various topics or a hand history review or something like that. So we upload one of those each week as well. We have five new hands that initially, like our three, 4,000 hands were just like written explanations. Like we went into our poker tracker and got 30 hands from each of the different nodes and paired them uh, and then wrote correct and incorrect answers and wrote written explanations. But now in the five new hands per week, it's actually a video response to what the decision is. So it's much more elaborate, elaborate on what the correct decision is. Middle game, approaching the bubble, direct bubble, post bubble, approaching the final table and then final table play, heads up, you know, three handed, et cetera. Um, and talks about like what you should be thinking about at each stage. And so I think one of people's biggest issue in tournaments is knowing what they should be doing. Are they risk on, are they risk off and why? And we help people really give a detailed understanding of that in the closer. And then we also have a full final table review of his WPT five diamond win. Oh, cool. Yeah. I actually, um, I had a couple questions. I am curious if the AI or perhaps the closer goes into decisions related to ICM and future game situations, because I find those to be firstly wildly more complicated than I thought uh, and very difficult. I don't think any of, I, I don't know how well these top players are playing them with some of the things I've seen because they're not easy to play. Um, yeah, and... I would say that the, the closer definitely has some because, you know, we're looking at final tables and different stacks and in the video reviews, we discuss 
the benefits of doubling up and sometimes the lack of benefit of doubling up if there's someone who's a big chip leader. And so we definitely do talk about that future equity. And I would say early on in the life of the AI platform, um, we do have like a lot of hands that are like, what's the optimal decision under ICM conditions? But I think that was a little bit limiting. And so in all of the future hands that we added, it's like there's 23 left, three tables, you're four of 23, what should your decision be? So, you know, as we get more elaborate and the platform gets better and better, we've been being more specific as to what the ICM questions are and then the answers and explanations in the video format really get into those future game decisions. Okay, uh, well, it sounds like you have some stuff related to that. Uh, I'm curious to check it out myself to see how deep it goes just because um, I, I specifically want to look at the ICM stuff like later in the game, like uh, related to final table decisions uh, because those are pretty big EV and not at all obvious. Um, people I think would say oh, the, the most future game and ICM stuff we have is uh, Brace 100 like two. 2.0 that's coming out soon. So Fox and won the 250K a couple summers ago. And PokerGo is nice enough to allow us to review it for a product. Um, and in that we go through every single hand. There's a bunch of hands that we have like add-on sims for where we break them down in even more detail. And in that situation, we talk about future game and ICM considerably more than any of the other products. Uh, okay, okay. Um, what about how, I mean, one obvious thing, uh, I wonder if any of your products go into this, is how preflop varies a lot in the different stages of the tournament. Is that uh, maybe the, um, what is it, the closer perhaps? Or yeah, would that be the we AI? definitely reference that some in the closer. Okay, but yeah, because there's some things, subtleties there that uh, are not so obvious. Uh, I, uh, I messed up quite a, a handful of those things during playing a bit of tournaments myself. So that's something I'm personally curious about. And like, I think that Which would be- Which side did you error on? On playing too loose, like playing too many suited connectors and that kind of shit. Um, I mean, some obvious things are like, don't play pocket pairs from early position. It seems <laughs> stupid when you think about it. Uh, I mean, I was re-jamming some pocket pairs in some bad spots also, as an example. I don't think my post slop's really that good in comparison to what uh, the short, post flop should be, but that's a much more complicated fix. Like I'm kind of, I was kind of thinking to myself, okay, I now have like a set of problem of problems. And now how do I like optimize for which one, as you, as you like start to branch out and do too many things, you you have the situation of, okay, there's a problem of problems uh, of like how to fix, or where does it make sense to like, uh, to go deeper into, or where does it doesn't, where does it not? And so I decided, okay, I, it, for tournaments, I'm not gonna play that much. So. What I would like to do is, but I need to be able to like assist people to guide them towards the right path of what they, how to become successful. So I need to be like knowledgeable enough to do that and to tell them, okay, this is where the value is at. You need to focus on this, which would be, um, you know, around the bubble play or whatever it is, like future game to some extent, like a limited amount. And then um, a lot of the pre-flop for, pre-flop and ICM for, um, uh, final table, there's huge value there. Um, beyond that, kind of can learn catch games on the side and I'll be, get you to a pretty competent level anyway. And if I was personally gonna learn tournaments, I would focus on like the ICM stuff and- uh, You're also the, playing like smaller fields, bigger buy-ins, right? So the frequency in which you get to this stage where it matters is much higher. You know, a lot of people, and I would say the vast majority of poker players, even the ones that would be looking to you for guidance, are people that are playing these $400 tournaments that have 3,000 people and they need to, to know the knowledge to get there. You know, they're going to get there at such a rare frequency. It's kind of like what you talked about before is studying pre-flop before flop turn in a river. Well, yeah, they could have the best future equity or, you know, game decisions, ICM ever, but if they're not going to get there to be able to use them, what does it matter? So I think that the average person really needs to dial in the earlier stages stuff better. Like I had you make a, a very... webinar with a student recently and they were like, I really like getting their level five because I hate when all the pots are like multi-way and you know, people keep sucking out and I'm like, okay, so you're saying pots are big and 
why not just get there earlier, play tighter and raise bigger and have good hands and just like pick up all the dead money. And then like that aspect, which is one of the things people are weakest at, like uh, it compounds, it snowballs into a bigger benefit. So now you have more starting, like more chips. And so the whales in the middle stages of the tournament are either out of the tournament or they typically have a lot of chips. There's not a lot of whales that have like starting stack when you late reg. And so now you have like two, three starting stacks and you're deeper with the whales. Plus you can take bad beats from the other short stacks. And so the equity of getting there on time for these like players, that's one of the biggest leaks I see. Um, yeah, those are some very good points. One thing I want to point out that slightly contrasting is that you, it, when you're factoring in an important factor in the life game tree of things, you have to factor in the time that you're uh, applying for things. This guy that when he's talking about sounds like he's optimizing for equity, in which case you're 100% right, where he should get there early and he should try to like, there's loads of equity in the beginning where all these guys are, you know, the whales of full buy-in or whatever, and people play like shit deep. And uh, yeah, you just raise bigger. You're, I mean, you're 100% right. And you make a very valid point. Um, well, before I say that, let me just add that if you're optimizing for time plus money, then you actually do want to late register unless it's a knockout tournament, is my understanding, because I have See, to buy. And that's what I thought at first, too. And that's one of the benefits of having these webinars and having me and Fox and all of our content is I said the same thing. You know, it's like, but sometimes the hourly in these other situations is way higher and it's worth it. Exactly what you said. And Foxy made like an incredible point that like every time we're playing poker, it's a learning experience too. And so it's not just about the hourly. It's about the opportunity to improve and learn. And so when you think of it from that perspective, it's like, yeah, max late regging might have the best hourly, but are you really going to learn anything at all in those 10 hands before you bust your double? That's a fair point, yes. So uh, I guess I, when you're thinking I was about on it, your side of the coin until three days ago, actually. Oh, okay. I mean, I I still wonder if it makes sense for me to like play through because, but it definitely makes sense for a lot of the people who are aspiring to make money to play from the beginning. I think that makes a lot of yeah. sense. And also, you made a very good point about what they should focus on in um, in the tournament to get better. But there's you, you actually brought up a point to me that I think is really valid. Once they get to somewhere around the, uh, or brought up an idea to me that I think is really important, once they get to the, around the final table, which is that once the buy-ins of these things become really big for a lot of the people, all of a sudden their their typical like weaknesses come out and their more like base behavior comes out. Where, I mean, this can mean a number of things, but uh, one of the problems that I just imagine a lot of like these up and coming players have. Uh, having is that they'll be like wildly in their head and not be able to they'll just be really really predictable in a lot of the spots and not be able to like exploit people properly so it might actually make sense for them to focus more on their mindset once they get to that point and kind of just think okay this is what and maybe even to pre-prepare and think okay this is what I should do against this kind of player and this kind of player and that that thing um, what are your thoughts on that um, I definitely agree but I also think that you're looking at the perspective of people trying to exploit others, uh, when in reality, the average player is just thinking about how they want to play their hand. And then when they're faced with the decision, maybe it's verse aggression, they're like, okay, this guy's tighter, this guy's loose, and then they play their decision. That's their version of an exploit. And so I don't think that the average player is like really doing anything, I would say. Um, but I will say that like one of the biggest leaks in poker is probably playing like too loose early and too tight deep when people actually, if everyone's doing that, then naturally we want to play tight early and loose deep, you know? And so you should always try to do the opposite of what everyone else is doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, I agree. Did you know, Jungle, that you gave me one of the most helpful pieces of poker advice I've ever received? What's that? I did not know that. Do you remember the house party we were at like 10, 12, 14 years ago? Vaguely. I feel like you've told me this in the past, but I think I forgot. But uh, I mentioned more to me now. once, but it's worth sharing on the podcast because I think it'll help a lot of people. Um, so I don't know how Jungle got there, but I had a house for the summer and there was like some kind of party going on and Jungle's there. I'm sitting out back. I'm rolling a blunt. Jungle's sitting there not partaking. Uh, he was too cool before I got too cool. Um, and I'm like smoking and I'm like, all right, so I got a question for you. I was like, what do you do? that's better than like what, what everyone else does. Like what separates you? Cause he was already elite 
And I was, you know, trying to learn. Do you remember what you said? I can guess what I said, but I want to hear what you said. Uh, I, right. I want to hear what you... You yeah, said, uh, you... I'm really good at knowing what my per opponents perceive that I have, and then knowing whether or not they would try to bluff this way or value bet this way. Uh, yeah, I would say something like that. Uh, I would say that... Um... Now I'd say it probably a little bit differently. I would say something like all pe people fall under different subcategories of, and this is actually unique to me, subcategories of behavior uh, where you can predict to a fair degree what a lot of these different types of people will do in a lot of these situations, uh, which is what you're talking about, like whether they're going to bluff in this certain situation or whether they're not. And a lot of the situations fall under different kinds of, there's even like boxes of situations essentially. Um, which is something that I tried to uh, point out. I mean, that aren't even, you know, like they're harder to pick up through some analytical machine. And even there's situations in which certain psycho psychological paradigms are at play, like on the final table or before the bubble, where people are actually really predictable for Incredible. quite a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, just uh, if you can figure out what generally speaking most players are doing you can kind of crush a lot of those players especially in this case you know the loose passives of a tournament that uh do mostly the same thing yeah it always really helped me i'm glad it helped you did you start bluffing people all the, in all the right spots and uh owning people a lot harder then or what i was already like pretty darn good at tournaments i would say but you know it's like we talked about surrounding yourself with people that can help you improve and that was just a question I remember asking you like we were just sitting on the back porch just the two of us at this big party and I was like hmm let's let's, let's pick jungle's mind a little bit uh, okay well um, I'm glad it helped you I, uh, I still think it's it's pretty true a lot of people um, I mean as you said I mean part of the way of getting out of this problem is surrounding yourself with like the right kind of minds uh, one thing that by the way that I I realized as I grew and like learned more things was I kept imagining myself to be special in some kind of way. And then I realized that even within, from a certain perspective, a lot of uh, what I did at least, at least initially until I realized ironically that it was in this category of like predictable from a certain perspective um, was I actually fell into being really generic in a lot of different ways. And realize, oh shit! Like I'm, I'm generic. I have to. Um, it's not necessarily a good thing. Um, in many ways, like even for example, there's a number of people that aspire to change the world, right? And the problem with a lot of those people is, or a lot of those people basically, you know, they lack the implementation to do things. They're not really serious. Um, but like, there's a lot of people that fall into that category. But there's a lot of people that fall into all kinds of different categories that most people are unaware of until they're aware of that. Um, which might make sense to you. It's not, it goes far beyond poker, is, is the point. It's really easy to be uh, put into a box of some kind. Even even to be an entrepreneur, by the way. Uh, yeah, it's like uh, the, the four stages of knowledge. Like you're an unconscious incompetent, and the highest one is like a conscious competent. But that second stage is like you think you know everything just because you're aware of it. And then the third stage, you you realize that you really don't know that much, and then you finally get it all. And so what you're talking about is like, when you're unconscious of it, it doesn't really matter. And then when you have that awareness of those different categories, it starts to click. Uh, yeah, I, and I'm also saying that the breadth of those categories is far greater than people imagine. Um, to, I mean, psychedelics or whatever might help you get there, hanging out with the right people. That's the piece of my sobriety that I miss the most is psychedelics. And I like have conversations regularly with like my wife and friends, and I'm like, I don't know, like maybe I'll do it again. Maybe you should do ayahuasca. That sounds like you know the most extreme version of it. I would always be afraid that I'd like go and do ayahuasca, and I'd want to like come home and leave my wife and family, and like <laughs> I don't know, man. Like ayahuasca is scary to me. Um. It's, uh, I will say if you're, I, I actually did predict my own personal response to ayahuasca. I don't think that'll be that crazy for you. 
But okay. I do think it will be very crazy for people that lead their lives more with emotion and are storing a lot of emotional baggage specifically. That's my personal prediction, but um, it looks like it's kind of true so far, but I could be wrong. But the more rational the person is, the less likely like something completely insane is going to happen. That makes um, sense. Unless like, that's my guess. As like, I knew a person five. young in my life that went and did ayahuasca. It was a friend of my mom's. And she went, we watched her dog while she was gone. She comes back after to from Peru after her experience and is like, do you guys want to keep the dog? I'm going to pack up all my things and move to Peru. But she was always like a very emotional lady. So yeah. I can see that being, uh, being true. Well, it's like one way that people can do things is if they're swayed heavily by emotions. There's like a different path of, of like going through life that actually does make sense, but it's more, more based off of trial and error versus like, the guidance of reason, if that makes, is my work way of uh, interpreting it. Um, okay. But it's hard to prove. This is just jungle speculation uh, based off of my observations. That being said, um, yeah, probably won't drive you that crazy, but uh, I wonder Maybe if I'll I'm... get back into mushrooms first before I jump all the way to the end of the end of the spectrum. It's probably cleaner is the funny thing than mushrooms. Really? Yeah, it's, um, it's, it actually was very clean. Uh, What's the experience and, like? I know what like tripping is like with like, I did LSD on safari once in South Africa. I've done mushrooms, you know, five or 10 times and maybe more in my life, but I don't even know how would ayahuasca compare to those? So for me, it was much like doing some LSD, but I'm particularly resilient against LSD from my experience. So, uh, and I actually went with a number of the Asian crowd. It didn't affect a lot of them that crazily. They're, it just kind of put them in a positive state, which is sort of similar to LSD if you don't like wildly overdose. Uh, I will say it's, um, yeah, it's mostly pretty pleasant unless, uh, unless you probably have one of the, the few potential side effects. Um, I just guess for most poker players, they're not gonna have many issues like that just because of the type of people they tend to be. Because um, they're founded it's in logic. A, yeah. Whereas like if your situations have, it's not just founded in a logic by the way, but it's also, it's also having the trait of being um, mentally flexible, but correcting quite fast if like things against negative feedback, where I feel like if certain people can like dig themselves into a hole of negative this is, this is jungle speculation, but if you can like get to the situation of where you have a lot of uh, baggage, negative baggage, like I think that that would blow up in your face if you're doing ayahuasca or some other form of thing that basically like scrambles whatever's going on in your mind so that now you kind of have to face it is what I, my interpretation of what happens. But in order to do that, you have to like not be very sensitive to negative feedback, but that's a trait that all successful poker players have is that if they lose money, or if things go bad, they fix that. It's an important trait. Yeah, we're good at brushing it off for sure. Like the emotional detachment almost. Um, well, that too. That's uh, uh, not like they're getting over things as well. Maybe that helps. Um, I'm just thinking, I'm just thinking to not, uh, where it's just unlikely that I think poker players in general go down deep holes of darkness is what I'm yeah. saying. But I, I mean, there's exceptions to that, of course. So, so don't do um, it after your downswing. <laughs> that could, yeah, that could rattle if, uh, or, or if like, I was thinking, to be honest, if someone was like scamming for a living and like, or doing something that they f***ing hate for a living, like that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and I, or just doing things that they hate to do, then it might rattle them pretty hard. Uh, for me, I can say that, uh, it sure seemed like magic, whatever what was happening in my mind. It was as if this thing had a magic way of teaching me. That's basically what happened to me. Um, and it's really hard to like, I can't prove that it was magic, but whatever was going on in my mind seemed to be perfect for what my intentions were. And it actually kind of blew my mind for a second. Um, See, and I've always wondered if it's like the fact that the psychedelics open your brain or or give you a different perspective, I guess you could say. But I read something that said that psychedelics are one of the only things we know of that can help our brain create new, like, synapses. 
And so I, like, I've always wondered if we're actually learning a new way of doing things when we would take a psychedelic. I think, uh, I think it does give the potential for exploring new possibilities, but this is where it, it's just based off of my experience and it kind of like uncovers various things for your subconscious or whatever it is that aren't necessarily um, uncovered for. I don't know how it works scientifically, to be honest, but there's, uh, I, I would think that there's some kind of uh, reason, uh, uh, what's the word? Um, there's a lot of like, I can't think of the word, but there's a lot of like uh, given proof in a sense that it works just based because it's been along so long, or it's been, it's existed so long. Um, I forget, empirical evidence, that's the word. Mm. And uh, there's, I guess, a reason why these like Native American, excuse me, these South Americans like really valued this thing. I thought it was like uh, the magic plant. Um, and it was magic for me, I can tell you, or at least certainly appeared magic. And part of my trip was like actually that you can look at whatever happens as magic from a certain perspective, or you can look at it as dry science. That was one of the realizations that I had on the trip. Interesting. Well, after this conversation, I'm more likely to want to try it again, I would say, or to get um, back into that area. Yeah, it's suggested. I think it's, uh, it's not like some joke too. It's, you have to basically very, very clean when doing it. You have to not have any sugar. You have to not have any alcohol. You have to not have any, at some point they have you not eat any meat. Uh, yeah, they're very serious about a lot of things. So gotcha. the actual For your body to good. fully receive it, I guess. Yeah, and I guess it's there's some kind of risk. One person went crazy on our trip, but he was likely to go crazy. He was the, he had the type to go crazy, type of personality. <laughs> did he stay crazy or did he like come out of it? He came out of it, but he did end up naked on a bed uh, in the middle of. Uh, in the middle of the the grass, which is like you know twenty feet away from the place that we're all at, so I don't know how that happened. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, uh, yeah. People would have predicted this might have happened, um, but I will say no more about that. Yeah, yeah. Don't need to get into it. Have you found um, with your coaching a lot of ways to with not only help people in the realm of improving their mindset and the soft skills of poker, but also to find data to show that that has happened. Um, honestly, I, I'm not really sure. Uh, most of my conversations with students other than like boxing and then some of our like other coaches, I would say like before when they were doing the coaching for profit, uh, it was like Ryan Jones, who just got second in a tournament and Joe McKeon did some coaching with us and is married now. Um, but I don't really know too much about the personal lives of others. Like we had Simon Dedman and Daniel Strelitz, both successful family men now as well. Um, but as far as students, I would say that our relationship is more poker based. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, yeah, I was looking at one of your products and it looks like you covered a lot of bases with this uh, product of optimizing your mind. And I was curious, well, maybe they've actually got some data on this because that's one thing that's really tough to handle is like, is there proven data that shows X, Y works over another thing to- So the funny to... thing about that product is the lack of sales. I actually think it's extremely beneficial, but I would think that the problem with that is that people don't want to work on their mindset. Like I think you're very like open and realize the importance of being able to be in the right mindset, play your A game more often. But I think the biggest issue with people is it's not flashy. They want to learn how to three bet. They want to learn how to check where it is. They want to know if they should bluff all in on the river. And so it's just like if people have a limited amount of time to devote to poker training, they don't devote that time to the mindset. So I would say that, you know, most people just aren't interested in improving that area. Like I had mentioned early on in the interview that like one of the biggest improvements for me was working with Tommy Angelo and getting my mindset better. And most people just don't want to work on it. Um, I think that that's part of it. I can tell you what's going through my mind when I read something about working on my mindset. And it's taken me a while to get around to this. Um, but a big thing is 
I don't know if it actually benefits me that much. Uh, I've, I've kind of slowly gotten more towards the realm of like, okay, it really looks like it does because I've read enough books and I've seen various uh, benchmarks that seem to suggest really it does. But that would be my thought from a, from a pretty, that would be one of my thoughts if I was uh, from a different um, age, I guess you could say, is does this actually benefit me in comparison to learn how to three bet and bluff and all that? Like I would think that translates into money. That's a real thing. I don't know how much, you know, learning how to be Zen really helps me that much in general. Like does it help me? I don't know. On top of that, there's lots of like similar sorts of products out there, I guess, in the self-help industry that just don't work. Um, and like as someone who's explored the self-help industry, I realized, okay, everyone's just saying kind of the same thing and like what's good and what's not. And, you know, I'd read a book and it wouldn't really tell you how to, or if it did, it would be like, do these, these hundred things, but we're not going to walk you through them. There's just like all these hundred things that are very complicated to actually implement in someone's life. So of course the transition aspect is like quite limited. Um, so that would be at least the first couple of things. I don't know if the last thing is applicable, but because it's a course, that's just my personal thoughts. I haven't looked into the course at all or anything, but when yeah, I, but we definitely, the... I think there's a variety of different breathing exercises and stuff you can do some to be calming, some to give you energy, etc. And there is a portion in that course that like walks people through it. And then we demonstrate like what the exercises are for the students. But I would say like, just because it's not like the flashy desirable learning method. Um, we actually very soon in the next couple of weeks, people who are chip leader AI subscribers will have access to optimize your mind. So we're including it. You can buy it by itself if you want, or it'll be included in the AI subscription. Okay, cool. So people get a bit of a deal. And, yeah. Uh, I mean, we, we made it to help people, you know, I never really thought it would sell that much. Uh, I made it with like two of my mindset coaches and it just hasn't helped as many people as we would like. And so we decided to, to put it behind that other paywall as well. It's a fair, okay. Um, I know I'm personally intrigued by breath exercises that give you more energy because I want more energy. Um, that's something that I need. And uh, I, now I'm getting around to this idea of, okay, I uh, really think it's very valuable and absolutely no one has done this to like be able to focus for long periods of time, which is essentially what meditation is. And yeah. I think that- uh, like the ability to focus is a muscle, right? And the, it gets stronger the more we strengthen it, just like going to the gym and working out. And so I think that, you know, for me, when I prep for the World Series, like we have to focus for long periods of time for days on end, months on end. And so I actually start a meditation practice again. I make sure that when I'm doing anything for like the month before the WSOP, that I make sure to put 100% of my focus into that because I want to strengthen that muscle. I want to strengthen my ability to make decisions with 100% of my like mental RAM. So I think of us as like computers. And so if we're a computer and we have all these other applications that are open, then it's not gonna, the computer might not be strong enough to run the one application that we need. And so for me, it's like that mindfulness, that muscle that we strengthen is basically just like closing all the other programs in our brain and allowing us to focus on playing the best poker that we can. Um, makes loads of sense. I had this idea of like, does chance go and like be, uh, disappear for like a couple of days or so and just meditate <laughs> like as a free game thing. Dude, I've kind of <laughs> wanted to do like one of those silent retreats type things where you just like go, I don't know, silence or meditation for days on end. And to be honest, like I, when I did the Tommy Angelo stuff, I had a daily practice for a short amount of time. Uh, I don't anymore. I still have like a meditation bench and pillow somewhere actually in the office. So I just like, don't use it. Uh, but I think that, you know, whether you're at the gym and you're totally focused on your breathing and like your form, you know, there's when you're with your family, you can completely focus on that and like have your phone put away when you're at the poker table, you can be in airplane mode and only focus on playing. So, you know, that version, that strengthening of that muscle exists in all of our daily life activities if we allow it to. Um, yeah, it makes, uh, it makes a lot of sense in theory. Uh, it's just a matter of like getting it in practice. I know that, um, there's actually 
entrepreneurs and people like that that do disappear into uh, places to do something called deep work is what they call it. There's actually a book called this, by the way. Uh, and uh, I, that's to remove all distractions and things like that. I would like to try it at some point, which is not what you're talking about. You're talking about a Vipassana, I believe, uh, the, um, the, where you can't speak to anyone for 10 days and you have to do meditation for 10 fucking I don't know days. what it would look like. I just know that there's versions that are very meditative. Uh, Vipassana is kind of an extreme, semi-extreme thing. Uh, or I guess you could like retreat to a cave or do something like that. I might try to do some of that stuff in the future. Uh, but speaking of which, have you uh, traveled? It looks like you've traveled to quite a few places uh, for the sake of tournaments or just for fun. You, I know you went to Tanzania. Uh, yeah, so last year in the fall, we went back to China for the first time since COVID. So my daughter got to meet her grandma, my mom, my wife's mom. And uh, we were there for three weeks. And soon after, we were home for a week. And then we had our friends here watch our kid for two weeks. And we went to Tanzania for an epic safari, saw the Great Migration, saw so many incredible aspects and probably, you know, 300,000 animals while we were there. Um, and I'd done safari in Cape Town, like, you know, near Cape Town in South Africa before, and it's just not the same. Like, just the sheer number of animals. Like, when you're in South Africa, you're on, like, in a park, and you have to stay on the roads. When you're in Tanzania, you can take the, you're literally in the wildlife. There's no fences, no nothing, and you can, like, follow the animals around and get much closer to them. And, I mean, we saw... 45 elephants, 30 lions, just like in these groups. And like, I mean, it was crazy. So you did get out of the uh, van and get into the wild where there's lions and... No, no, no. So apparently, and this is something I learned on the trip, was that the lions, for example, they see the vehicle as one entity. And so that's why you're able to get so close to them. But if you were to like stand up or get out, they would attack you. Cause then you're all of a sudden smaller and you can get them, but like there's, you know, maybe scared of, not scared of the vehicles because they've been trained to know that the vehicles aren't going to hurt them, but you become prey if you get out. So no, when there's a, like, there was a big old male lion, like right next to the vehicle. And the guide was like, okay, nobody move. Time to be quiet. Like, I mean, it was, it was pretty cool. Um, you can actually get out of the van, by the way. Uh, in fact, I don't know if you went to Nagoro crater whatever it's called Nagoro yeah crater, we got out there mm -hmm. okay yeah it's probably one of the most beautiful places with all those animals that I've been to yeah it was cool really cool just a paradise man it was like straight up like somewhere out of uh, some Final Fantasy game or something like that yeah very sci-fi um, or maybe Lion King I don't know uh, but there are lions there for sure. No, Lion King we is did. actually based on somewhere in Tanzania, but it's not the Korogoro Crater. Oh, really? I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. uh, well, yeah, that place was really, uh, that place was amazing. We did get out. We did not get eaten by lions, uh, as it turned out. We actually, um, uh, this one crazy guy brought me up like a rock. I don't know if I'll do this again, but like, we went up like a rock, like later, like a little bit away from the general area where the lions were, but like in theory, a lion or something could have been there. I was scared shitless. Yeah. It's like, I mean, the so those out, rocks whatever. that you're talking about that are in that like area, um, there's one that's really big that they do call pride rock. That that's the ones that the lion king was like referenced off of. Oh, really? I took a picture of like a lion on one of those rocks and i said oh this is this big lion. it might have been the one <laughs> it wasn't that big but the lion was like actually on top of the rock like just like standing there for yeah some i mean the reason. crazy thing when you're there is just just like planes for ages right and then there's just randomly these rock formations that have all of this foliage and different like green stuff and like i mean it was very cool just such unique top topography did you visit the uh, tribe nearby? I forget what the tribe's called. The Maasai. Uh, that's another thing. Yeah, the Maasai. Did you visit so, them? So our guide was actually the prince of the Maasai, Robert. And yeah, really. like, there was this time where there was this pride of lions, just all females and children. And there was two other vehicles there. And so apparently the real law there is that you can only like park and look for like five minutes. So when we got there, 
they like know who he is and stuff. Uh, and he's also on the some board or group of the wildlife awareness. So he was able to tell the other vehicles to leave. And then he drove the vehicle like closer than you're supposed to. So we were literally right on top of this group of like 28 lions. It was wild. And so oh, wow. the Maasai, um, my wife and I actually had to leave. Our flight was earlier than the rest of the group, but the rest of the group at the end went to the Maasai village and his orphanage and stuff like that. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's uh, pretty wild. I mean, they have like huts and they're like wildly different from what you would expect from any even second world country. I mean, that's kind of obvious. Uh, one thing is uh, how they like pick their partners is apparently like the guy, they go in like a circle and like the guy who jumps the highest in the circle, they have like a jumping contest. And the one who jumps the highest gets like the girl, <laughs> like the Messiah tribe, that. that's all they, it's so we did some jumping when I was there and we like, uh, we learned how to throw a spear and all of that. Actually, when I, I did not jump very high, fortunately, or, or not fortunately, but uh, so, and we, uh, and uh, another thing is like, if you stay in one of the hotels there, you get like a Maasai person to guard you as you go back to your house in the yeah. hotel so that like a lion doesn't like, come and eat you. And the craziest thing about that is they literally had like sticks. I'm like, if a lion comes, what are you gonna do with that stick? He's like, you run, I'll take care of it. I'm like, what? Maybe, yeah, I don't know how that's gonna work, but okay. Yeah, so apparently they're trained like based on which animal it is. Cause we asked, cause that was my first thought. I'm like, dude, you have a stick. If a lion comes, what the hell are you gonna do? And he's like, well, like certain animals, you hit them on the nose with the stick, certain animals, you flash the lights. And I was like, oh, okay. So they actually do have a plan based on how the animals react to confrontation, I guess you could say. I didn't ask too many questions, but um, yeah, I was lucky enough to survive that. I don't know if like, they really can handle the lions. Uh, I guess they can. I know that if you kill a lion in one of these tribes, you also get a girl. That's part of the, the Maasai deal. So you either got to be a high jumper or a lion killer? Something like that, yeah. <laughs> you know, I travel, I travel in the U.S. for poker mostly these days. I will start going to Triton soon. But I don't know. Before we had our kid, we used to travel all over the world. Like I, my trip to Cape, uh, not Cape Town, but the other major city there um, was for poker. Australia, Monte Carlo, Barcelona, Europe, you know, EPTs, all that different stuff. And now I think that I would feel bad being away for like two weeks from the family if it wasn't just WSOP. Like this WSOP, my wife and little girl are actually going back to China without me for three weeks. So the first three weeks I'll be there to focus. And then when they fly back through San Fran, they're coming to Vegas to be with me. So my focuses these days are a lot more for pleasure. Like we have a Euro trip uh, in the fall this year where we're going to Prague, Munich and Austria, I think. Not in that order. No, yeah, well, that should be, I guess, must be pretty fun, I would think. I, I can't really relate too much to the family. Travel. Yeah, we, uh, we're great. going for Oktoberfest at the end. Uh, that was like the initial reason for the trip. And then a couple of our friends here in Nashville, um, one of them has a birthday around then and they were looking for an excuse. So we decided to add on the two cities beforehand and make like a real Euro trip out of it and should be pretty fun and we're, again like that's one of the reasons we moved to nashville is my wife's best friend's mom is like a grandma to us to us here and so it's like you know i know you don't have kids right no so for no, those who do have kids you probably would know that like when people watch your kids and it's not like a babysitter it's like they're doing you a favor and you're like oh thank you so much yada 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 but when this lady, Oma, we call her, watches our daughter, she's the one thanking us. She's like, oh, thank you so much. And it's like so nice that like we can actually make a trip with just my wife and I and have the ability to you know, travel the world. Or in April, we're going to Stagecoach and she's watching her for a few days. So just like these little things that allow us a little more freedom having a child. That's like one of the biggest draws to Nashville for us, I would say. Well, that's cool. I'm glad you found the, like, Cool, a good babysitter that actually likes it. Yeah, <laughs> seems like a challenge. Seems like it could be. Um, well, good luck with that. 
Any last uh, words to finish the podcast on? Uh, any last uh, things you'd like to mention? Other trips or future plans? Uh, no, nah, I mean, I'm excited for in April. I'm finally going to play poker again. Like this four month, it'll be almost a three month break. Yeah, three month break from poker will be my longest break from poker ever. So I'm really excited to like go down to the Seminole WPT and then they have like a 10K heads up, a 25K, 50K, like all of the bigger stuff. And, uh, you know, get myself prepared for the WSOP. So it's been a really fun three months of uh, grinding uh, from a business perspective. And now I'm excited to get back into what I love is like building stacks. All right. Well, um, good luck with that. And uh, good luck with being the chip leader at the poker so you can teach more people at chip leading coaching chip leader coaching i think i got it right this time clcpoker.com we got a bunch of good free stuff in there for you too